I would like to welcome you to the Prairie Plains Church of Christ Bible Study for July the 26th of 2020 and to our present study in the book of James. In our study from James chapter 1, we realize our faith must be tested. A coach thinks that he has a great team. How does he know that? He doesn't know that until he plays some games. He doesn't know that until the team has been tested. For you see, it's easy to say, I have faith. How do we know that we have faith? I want you to listen to what Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and verse 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he says that the testing of our faith, hopefully, when it's tested by these fires that we face in our lives, it'll be much purer than fine gold that it would bring praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ. For you see, our faith is being tested, as we've seen from James chapter 1, by our attitude. Our attitude towards trials. Our attitudes towards God. Our attitude towards the Word of God. Our attitude towards self-control. Our attitude, our, our attitude in visiting the fatherless and the widows. Today, our lesson, our faith, is being tested by our reaction towards other people. In James chapter 2, verse 1, it says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Another translation says, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim that you have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people more than others? When he makes the statement, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is encompassing all of Christianity, the faith that has been delivered. When we look at the faith, when we look at God's Word that's been delivered, how can we show respect of persons? That is what this text in James 2, 1-13 through is dealing with. It is dealing with partiality. It is dealing with prejudice. It is dealing with racism. This is a very difficult lesson for you see, all of us have some form of prejudice. We prejudge. There's some form of that in all of our lives, and I have it in my life. Oh, it may not be between races, but it is found in other areas, and it is something that we need to work on, all of us, and especially me. In verse 4 of James 2, it says, Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Another says, Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? He's dealing with Christians. He's dealing with the church of Jesus Christ. Those that have been added to the church, those that have been saved, as we see in Acts 2.47 and Acts 2.38. NIV says, Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So he's writing to Christians and he says, There is inconsistency in practicing the pure religion that he's mentioned in chapter 1. He says, that they are dividing the church, showing partiality to the rich in chapter 2. They are neglecting the poor 
evidently as we see from James chapter 1. Now what makes us so different than the Christians to whom James is writing? If you look at verse 3, Have you not respect to him that weareth the gay clothing? Now, the word gay there means fine clothing. It means l luxurious clothing. Elegancies in dress or style. So we could say, have you respect to him that dresses richly, very eloquently, and say unto him, come up here, sit in this good place. Then you turn your face and say to the poor, stand thou here or sit here under my footstool. Out of prejudice, out of prejudging, they were attracted to the man who was rich. Given the best seat in the assembly because of what he has, what he possessed. Things haven't changed with us in this century or last century. How many times have I heard in my life, if we could convert him or her, he or she would be such a great contribution to the church. If he became a member, it would help the church's image in the community. Oh, he would feel more at home with his own kind. In other words, say on the other side of the railroad tracks, don't come here. These are expressions that people have expressed not only in this decade or last century. It's been going on through the history of men. What did James say they would ask the poor man to sit? He says, stand over there, not here. You can't have this seat. And if they do allow him to sit down, it is in a degrading place. He says, under my footstool, where no one can see him. Some paraphrase translations have rendered this second option as sit on the floor. The point is, that there is a world of difference in the way these two men are being treated by the church, by Christians. Instantly, someone might voice the objection, we aren't rude like that, are we? We wouldn't ask someone to sit on the back row, would we? We wouldn't ask someone to sit on the front row, would we? We wouldn't ask someone to leave our services because of their lifestyle, would we? We wouldn't ask someone to leave our services because of the color of their skin, would we? We wouldn't tell someone to stay on their side of the railroad tracks, would we? The point James is making is that when you show preferential treatment to someone completely based on their outward appearance, you are showing respect of persons. You are showing partiality. A passage from an aged book giving instructions for the minister in the worship service from the book entitled Ethiopic Statutes of the Apostles. Now this wasn't inspired, but I want you to listen to the struggles that they were having outside of God's Word. It says, the purpose I'm sharing this with you is not because it is part of our Bible, but to show you the problem of prejudice and racism that was taking place during this time. Quote, If another man or woman enters in fine clothes, either a man of the district or from other districts, being brethren, thou presbyter, while thou speakest the word which is concerning God, or while thou hearest or readest, thou shalt not respect persons, nor leave thy ministering to command places for them, but remain quiet. For the brethren shall receive them, and if they have no place for them, the lover of brothers and sisters will rise and leave a place for them. And if a poor man or woman of the district or of other districts should come in and there is no place for them, thou presbyter, make place for such with all thy heart. 
even if thou wilt sit on the ground, that there should not be the respecting of persons of man, but of God. I wish I could give credit to where I found that, but I found it years ago. And, and like some points in this lesson that I made, I cannot give you the, where I, the name of the, where I received it. Oh, in the book of James, the brethren wanted a close relationship with God. But that was not possible with their respect of persons, with their present attitude. In his autobiography, I read that Gandhi wrote that during his student days, he read the Gospels seriously and considered converting to Christianity. He believed that in the teachings of Jesus, he could find a solution to the caste system that was dividing the people of India. So, one Sunday, he decided to attend services at a nearby church and talk to the minister about becoming a Christian. When he entered the sanctuary, however, the usher refused to give him a seat and suggested that he go worship with his own people. Gandhi left the church and never returned. If Christians have cast differences also, I might as well remain a Hindu, is what he stated. That usher's prejudice not only betrayed Jesus, but also turned a person away from trusting Him as Savior. In the military, there's quite a distinction made between rank, especially between officers and enlisted men. Behind the lines in World War I, Rest houses were operated which were designed to serve as places of fellowship for all soldiers, whether officers or enlisted men. Over the interests of such houses were posted these words, Abandon all rank, ye who enter here. So I want to ask the question, what is prejudice? I found a quote I'd like to share with you. It is the lock of the door of the closed mind. It is the ignorance we usually mistake for reason. It is the first enemy of information and progress. It is intellectual astigmatism. It is perfect combination of conceit and ignorance. It is the defense of the devil, shell of petrified mind, and the sealing of understanding. The Cambridge Dictionary states as unfair and unreasonable opinion or feeling, especially when formed without enough thought or knowledge. Webster defines it. Preconceived judgment or opinion, an opinion or leaning adverse to anything without just grounds or before sufficient knowledge. An irrational attitude of hostility directed against an individual against a group, a race, or their supported characteristics. Could we not say one who practices prejudice practice snobbery? You see, prejudice is closed-mindedness. The most difficult thing to do is to open a closed mind. A Scottish preacher once prayed, Lord, may we always be right, for Thou knowest we will never change our minds. Prejudice is condemnation without investigation. Quote, There's a principle which is a bond against all information, which is proof against all argument, and which cannot fail to keep the man in everlasting ignorance. That principle is condemnation before investigation. Prejudice is a great time saver. It enables us to form convictions without bothering to get the facts. Bob Burns used to tell of his uncle, who was a judge, and who during a court session pounded the gavel and said, Folks, we are going to have to be quieter. I've had to convict the last five men without hearing a word of testimony. Prejudice is to convict someone without proper consideration of the facts involved. Well, what is racism? I'd like to read you what Webster says very briefly. A doctrine or teaching without scientific support that claims to find racial differences in character, 
intelligence, and so forth, that asserts the superiority of one race over another or others, and that seeks to maintain the supposed purity of a race or races. Someone says, not me. I'm not prejudiced. I'm not racist. Well, what about us? Have you ever decided you would not like a certain preacher before you ever met them? Before you ever talked to them? Before you ever spent time with them? What about an elder? What about a neighbor? What about a co-worker? What about a cashier at the grocery store? If so, you're guilty of prejudice. You're guilty of condemning without investigation. You're guilty of judging according to outward appearance. You're guilty of convicting without evidence. May I say, I am guilty. For I have done the same thing in my life that I regret. And that I repent of. I can remember when I was a teenager, there was a boy that was on my Babe Ruth baseball team that I did not like simply because of appearance. And we ended up being the best friends in high school. And I told him one day about how I felt with him initially, and he told me he felt the same way about me. Let's don't be prejudiced. Let's don't show racism in our lives. Why don't you listen to some scriptures? John chapter 7, verse 24. He says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and, without, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Still think that we are innocent of this sin? Listen to some of these quotes. Have you said some of these things without investigating? Without thinking? In some of them you could never investigate. All doctors are quacks, really? Have you been to all doctors? All lawyers are liars. Is that really true? All politicians are crooks. Do you know all politicians well enough to make that statement? The elderly, well, there are, they are just all old fogies. You don't know some of the elderly that I know. Young people have gone to the dogs. You don't know some of the young people that I know. Here's a good one. All preachers are dumb and will not do anything. They're lazy and can't hold down a job, will not do anything without being paid. They will not pay their bills and expect to receive discounts on everything or expect everything to be given to them. Listen, I've heard some of these accusations made against preachers. I am a preacher. I know that some of these things aren't, all these things are not true with all preachers. How about this one? The rich are greedy, dishonest, merciless, will walk all over to you to get ahead to make another dollar. I've known men that are wealthy, a lot wealthier than I am, and they have hearts of gold, and they're very generous, and they would help anyone in need. What about this one? The poor are lazy. They will not work. They want everything given to them. All of them are on food stamps, welfare, and will do nothing to get off. Now that is not true. Are there some? Absolutely. Just with all of these. But we're practicing prejudice and prejudging when we make statements of this nature. About 50 years ago, a preacher sought to move from a very small church where he received a limited support to a larger church where he gains financially. And a member of the larger church told on other preacher following, told this preacher after his tryout 
sermons. He said, he preached good lessons, but the suit he wore was not as nice as we want our preacher to wear. That is terrible. And when we've, we've made any of these statements, it's a sad commentary on our own selves. What about, was racism practiced in the Bible? Absolutely. This is just the first in two parts that I want us to look at today. But racism was practiced. Prejudice was practiced. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And Miriam Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, Hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. Moses married a Cushite woman. Was it Miriam? The Cushite woman, as some believe, remember, she is a daughter of a Midianite. It would be unlikely that a Midianite priest would be from Cush. Miriam was the daughter of a Midianite priest. Cush was located south of Ethiopia, known for their dark skin. It reminds me of what we read in Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Of course, the answer, implied answer is no. Evidently, this was an interracial marriage. And a few questions I have. Was it a coincidence that God gave Miriam leprosy? In Numbers 12.10, the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. It meant that God left. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Does Miriam think Moses has lowered himself in marrying a Cushite woman? Does she consider her Hebrew race as superior to that of the Cushites? Is the Cushite woman being elevated more than Miriam by being Moses' wife in her mind and heart? Is Moses' wife better looking, younger, more appealing to Moses and to the people? Why does Miriam have this attitude? When you study this context, you will see that God defended Moses in marrying this Cushite woman. Do you know the reason why some object to allowing different races into a black church or a white church? We see it right here, don't we? Right here in this context. They do not want to be associated with someone with a different skin. God forbid. That is anti-biblical. In John chapter 4, verses 7 through 9. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. You have the problem between Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were hated more than the Gentiles by the Jews. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 11, we have another example of prejudice practiced in the Bible. Matthew 9, verse 9 says, And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom, and he saith unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus said at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Notice the ETH. He continues to eat with publicans and sinners. For you see, the Pharisees thought that they were better than everyone else. I'm not better than anyone. And I've got news for you. In God's eyes, you're not better than anyone else either. All of us are created in the image of God. Listen to Luke chapter 7, beginning in verses 36 through 39. 
And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she saw, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man... If he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth, his, toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Remember, it's just not one touch. It's ETH. Continue to touch him. Then picking up verse 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he saith unto her, thy sins are Again, oh, brothers and sisters, church, we need to learn how to forgive. We need to learn how to receive and to accept men and women in the name of Christ. Listen to what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye all are one in Christ Jesus. The Jews viewed the Greeks to be unclean and inferior. Some claimed that God made Gentiles so there would be firewood in hell. Many refused even to look upon a Gentile in public. Now, if that's the way they felt towards the Gentile, just think how they felt towards the Samaritans. We need to remember how the Gentiles persecuted Jewish people. You can say throughout the history. The Christian post stated, what does the Bible say about racism? Listen to what it says. For their part, Gentiles persecuted the Jewish people across nearly their entire history. The Jews were enslaved by Egypt, attacked by the Canaanites and other surrounding tribes, destroyed by Assyria, enslaved by Babylon, and ruled by Persia, Greece, and Rome. The Roman Empire destroyed their temple in A.D. 70. What did Paul write in Galatians 3.28? That there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither Jew nor Gentile in the eyes of God. In the body of Jesus Christ. There is neither slave nor free. It was a revolutionary claim. Many, there were many slaves throughout time and in the first century. Many viewed slaves, especially those who came from foreign lands, as inferior. And it says there is neither male and female was a radical statement also. Romans considered women to be the possessor of men. A female belonged to her father until she belonged to her husband. Women were either wives or concubines with few rights of their own. Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 sounds the trumpet call very loud and very clear that every form of prejudice, racism, prejudging known in Paul's day was invalid and sinful. And the same thing holds true today. Paul repeated this teaching in Galatians chapter 3 verses 8 through 11. But now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in all. I submit to you today in God's Word in Acts 10.34 it states that God is not a respecter of persons. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God desires 
all men to be saved, regardless of background, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of who their parents, regardless of their social status. In 2 Peter 3, 9, He does not want anyone to perish, but He wants all to come to repentance. And in Romans 1, 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. Why? Because it is the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the only power of God unto salvation for all. And all that obey that are in one body. And if we can't be in one body and get along together today, how do we expect to be in heaven together? and get along together in heaven. Next week, we're going to continue to look at this study. And we're going to next week look at some scriptures and events in the Bible that people who practice racism and prejudice in their lives that they use to try to support their beliefs. And we're going to be studying that hopefully next week. Let's be disciples of Christ. Let's have the mind of Christ. Let's follow in His steps rather in the steps of the wisdom of men rather than our own steps. It's not within man to direct His steps. Jeremiah 10.23 God's ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8-11 There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14.12 Let's seek out God's will in our lives. And I hope this lesson will help all of us to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Thank you.